It's always a pleasure to be here, and um, I'd like to thank again Leslie for organizing this meeting uh, again today for the eighth year. And I think my job now for the next 30 minutes is just to give you an overview on last year in review. And I'm going to present, uh, let's say, five paper with a little uh, twist at the end. Um, so let's see what... Uh, Oops. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to start with the first paper, which um, uh, you may have seen. It's about neuromuscular blockade in ARDS. And this was the uh, ROSE trial from the PETL network and was conducted in the United States. And this was the question. So the question was, in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, and they define it as a PF ratio less than 150. So you can see this is in... Uh, um, similar to the previous trial, the Accuracis trial, uh, which was less than 150, but it doesn't follow the Berlin definition of ARDS, which would be less than 200. So keep that in mind. So it's 20 kilopascal in UK uh, measures. So in patients with moderate severe ARDS, does the use of cisatrocurum infusion for 48 hours and deeper sedation, this is quite important, so keep that in mind, reduce in hospital death for many cause and 90 days compared to usual care and lighter sedation. So two strategies, neuromuscular blockade and different level of sedation. So the problem is with cisatrocurium, there are some pro and cons. So the pro is that neuromuscular blockade allows control of transpulmonary pressure, and Professor Pelosi will talk to us later on about the importance of transpulmonary pressure. And then neuromuscular blockade reduces asynchrony, and we'll see why is that important. It might have some anti-inflammatory activity. You have seen some uh, preclinical and clinical paper giving that idea. But there are some cons as well. So patients who are neuro with neuromuscular blockade might need a deeper sedation. And there is the question of whether or not increases the uh, um, prevalence of neuromuscular weakness. We'll see that later on. So this is what they did. They took the moderate severe RDS, had to have PEEP greater than 8, low tidal volume and high PEEP. And then 501 patients were randomized to cisatrocurium and deeper sedation, and 505 usual care and lighter sedation. And they targeted RAS score between 0 and 1. And what you can see, this is a preview. I'll show you with the next few slides a bit more in detail some of the primary, secondary, and some exploratory outcomes. And you can see the in-hospital mortality of 90 days was essentially the same. 42.5 versus 42.8. But this is something I picked out from the analysis, and maybe it's a point of discussion. Uh, it's about ICU-acquired weaknesses at day 28. You can see the cisatrocurum was 46.8, and this is 27.5. Now, you can say from a statistical perspective, the P is slightly greater than 0.05, but we'll later on, uh, Professor Harrison will talk about that, maybe in detail. Um, but you can see the difference is minus 19.4, and you can see the confidence interval just goes above, uh, um, above one, sorry, above zero. Okay, so we'll see. What you can see here, this is the percentage of patients who receive neuromuscular blockade in the intervention group in the light uh, blue. Uh, and you can see for the first uh, 48 hours, the compliance is really high. Almost 100% of these patients get the interventions they were supposed to get. Um, and the control group, you can see about one in five, just about less than one in five, gets neuromuscular blockade anyway. So there is a certain number of patients who does get the intervention, uh, the intervention. And this is here is the percentage of patients with light sedation. It's quite clear there's a zero, zero to sort of five percent in the intervention group, and this is part of the protocol, having a deeper sedation, and then it goes back up uh, and reach the same thing as control group about day seven. So they've done what they were supposed to do, so neuromuscular blockade and deeper sedation. But this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. Survive to discharge, essentially overlap, and discharge to home, control group, and intervention group, exactly the same. 
So when we go a little bit more in detail, you can see this is the primary outcome again, which is in hospital death at day 90, so slightly longer time point compared to the Accuracy's trial, 42.5 uh, versus 42.8. Not surprised to see that p-value that is um, um, not significant at all. But you can see all the other secondary uh, endpoints. Uh, you can see them over here. You can see their prevalence, and you see that the uh, difference is exactly the same. Now, this looks like a busy slide, so I'm going to sort of break it down a little bit and mainly point your attention to the ICU acquired weakness. You can see at day seven and at day 28, uh, you could see the difference there, so almost 47% versus 28%. Uh, and I think this is quite an interesting point, maybe for discussion later on about these trials. But this was also important. So the serious adverse events and cardiovascular adverse event were more prevalent in the intervention group. And this time you can see the p-value over there. So in conclusion, what they say is that a cohort of critically ill patients identified shortly after the diagnosis of moderate to severe RDS. So we're very early post um, diagnosis. The early continuous neuromuscular blockade with concomitant and deep sedation did not change the, uh, the, the outcome compared to the uh, control group. So this is the first trial. The second one was in February, and I think this is an important, again, Professor Pelosi will talk a little bit more in detail about this and maybe later on in the PROCOM debate this afternoon. Uh, so this is the effect of titrating PEEP using absolute esophageal pressure guided strategy. And this is quite interesting compared to the normal PEEP FIO2 scale on a composite outcome, which is death and day free from ventilation. Now you will see the next two trials use almost the same endpoints, and maybe we'll discuss later on whether this, uh, how good or how useful that combined endpoint might be, and what the limitations might be. But essentially you can see, this is your PICO question there. So in supine patients, this is quite important, very few patients received prone position. With moderate or severe ARDS, and this time was defined as per Berlin definition, does titrating PEEP according to Lang mechanics, and in that case used absolute uh, esophageal pressure. By absolute means they, they um, measured the end expiratory pressure with the esophageal pressure, and they matched or went above uh, that value using PEEP. Okay, compared with an empirical high PEEP FIO2 strategy, does that improve ventilation-free days at day 28? And what they did, you can see there in the population, uh, these are the numbers of men and women, average age was 56, uh, 14 locations in US and Canada, and the randomization was 102 patients with the esophageal pressure guided PEEP versus the empirical PEEP uh, FIO2. So what did they found? Now, this is busy on purpose. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, this is just the, uh, their protocol. And I thought it might be useful just to have an idea what they did. In the, this is the uh, esophageal pressure-guided PEEP. This is the empirical PEEP FIO2. And what you can see, change the FIO2, they change the PEEP. This is very similar to the um, the oscillate uh, trial, so they took exactly the same from the oscillate trial, and then the um, um, esophageal pressure, what you can see based on the FIO2, they changed the transpulmonary pressure at the end of expiration, so they matched the PEEP plus 2, they matched the PEEP plus 4, etc. But regardless of what the uh, protocol was, you can see here that the box and whisker plots in the blue and the yellow, they are exactly the same. So the end expiratory pulmonary pressure was the same, regardless of which protocol they used. Uh, the set PEEP was the same. But I want to show you some of these dots. Some of the PEEP here are above 30. It's very interesting. So very high PEEPs. But the average was between 15 and 17. 
and all the other elements are exactly the same. So what they did, if we follow the same diagram, so 102 versus 98, the outcome was uh, um, um, ventilator three days, but you can see here the mortality is exactly the same, but what was different was the rescue treatment. So 3.9 in the high uh, PEEP, sort of using the um, esophageal, and 12.2%. But again, as we said at the beginning, the final and primary outcome was exactly the same. Okay, so a little bit more in detail, but essentially this is what I would like you to um, concentrate. This is the rescue therapy administered, and we've seen 4% in the esophageal versus 12.2% in the empirical uh, treatment. But also, what you can see here, the uh, um, use of prone position was really low, 1%, 3%. So this is truly just supine and PEEP strategy. The um, use of ECMO was very low, 1%, 3%. Recruitment maneuvers was exactly the same. And here is something I can't explain. Uh, maybe in the discussion later on, but the esophageal pressure-guided group had a statistically, well, almost a statistically significant reduction in acute kidney injury. Now, a statistician might say that if you do enough tests, some of them will become positive. So that's my only explanation for now, but we'll talk about this later on. Okay, and this is the Kaplan-Meier curve for those of you who like colored uh, lines, and essentially they overlap, okay? So this is the conclusion, and essentially if we use a uh, esophageal pressure, but this is just using the absolute pressures. As you know, there are two ways of using esophageal pressure, and Professor Pelosi will illustrate that, compared to this traditional PPFIO2, there is no difference. So I'm going to go to the third one, uh, which is cheating a bit, because this is not exactly 2018, but I thought it was so important to discuss that I took uh, the liberty of using few months grace and use the 2017 as well. So this is the effect of lung recruitment and titrated PEEP, we'll see later on, versus low PEEP, and see whether they've achieved it in acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so that's the question. The question is whether the use of uh, lung recruitment maneuvers plus PEEP titration according to the best respiratory system compliance reduced 28, mortality, 28 days mortality in patients with moderate severe compared to a conventional strategy. Okay, so this is what they did in a pictorial form. So you can see here airway pressure, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. They started with that sort of pressure, uh, 25 of PEEP, and then every minute they went up to 35 of PEEP, maintaining a delta pressure of 15. So 35 over 50, and then 45 and 60. How many people use PEEP like that, or peak pressure like that during recruitment maneuver? I see lots of heads that move side to side, but essentially that's what they did. And then you can see, kept it there for about two minutes, and then went down progressively by three every four minutes. And then when they identified the best PEEP, they went back up to 60 and chose the optimal therapy. And so this is what you see, the randomization is uh, 1,010 patients, and they're split in the two groups, as you see over there. And what you can see is that the effect estimate was 1.2. So what it means, there was a 20% relative increase in mortality in the patients who received this aggressive lung recruitment and high PEEP, okay, compared to the low PEEP group. And the other thing that happened was this. Look at the, um, uh, here, the death within six months, 65% versus, let's say, 60%. But the number of ventilation-free days was slightly lower in the one with the more aggressive treatment, but I wonder whether this is um, clinically significant rather than statistically significant. And what you can see here, there was, although the absolute numbers of barotrauma were low, you can see 3%, 1.2%, which you might say are quite low. Again, though, there is a difference between the group uh, uh, against the highest pressure strategy. So when you look at the exploratory outcome, 
this is, I thought, was quite interesting. So you see death within the first seven days, 32% versus 25.5%. So there was much earlier death uh, in the uh, intervention group, and that might be due to the initial high recruitment strategy that these patients had at the beginning. And you can see that lots of these patients died with barotrauma. Uh, and died also with some essentially shock because the number of uh, patients needed to increase or uh, commence um, vasopressors was much higher in this group. And you may expect that given the intrathoracic pressures. Now, what you can see here is quite interesting. So there's very little difference at the beginning and then they diverge and they continue to diverge. And you don't need me to restate the conclusion that you can see over there, essentially, in these patients. This is one of the uh, trials that shown a difference be between the two groups and the next one again. So you can see lung recruitment titrated PEEP is inferior to the conventional one. Now, this is quite interesting. I'm going to give you a couple of slides that uh, are not in the paper. Uh, uh, and this one was given to me by uh, Professor Amato. What you can see here is that, essentially, although the protocol was to use PEEP, uh, titrated against the best compliance, often this was not achieved. What you can see here, essentially this is electrical impedance tomography using PEEP titration, so from 25 to 5, and this is your compliance, the number of uh, areas that over distended or, or collapsed, but essentially this is an interesting point. So you can see the pre-optimization had a compliance of 32, and a driving pressure of 13. And the post so-called optimization had a compliance which was lower than the beginning and a driving pressure that was higher than the beginning. Clearly, something went wrong in that optimization. So there are a certain number of patients who have got that sort of uh, um, uh, pattern. And you might wonder whether the optimization really worked. And then the other thing was this. So for some of these patients, because the tidal volume was so low, close to five um, mils per kilo of ideal body weight, and they were in uh, volume control, these patients found it very difficult to breathe in volume control at five mils per kilo, and they started breath stacking, so double triggering and breath stacking. As a consequence of that, this patient is receiving 12 mil per kilo of ideal body weight of tidal volume, which we know is quite injurious. And then the fourth one, uh, and I think Professor Rose will talk, maybe will talk or comment about this during the weaning talk later on today, but it's uh, the, the effect of pressure support versus T-piece ventilation. In, during spontaneous breathing. And this was, again, two weeks ago, uh, published in JAMA, so very recent. And this is the question. So what is the effect of a less demanding 30 minutes uh, SBT with uh, pressure support ventilation? And this pressure support was pressure support of eight and PEEP of zero uh, versus a more demanding, so two hours of T-piece ventilation. So in other words, Press support zero, PEEP zero, on rates of successful extubation, which they defined as remaining extubated for 72 hours post-extubation. So this is the visual <coughs> abstract uh, that you see on the JAMA website. So this is the population. So these are all adult ICU patients, not necessarily ARDS, not at all. Could be anyone requiring ventilation for more than uh, 24, hours, 24 hours. You can see the mean age was mainly in Spain, multi-center in Spain. This is the number of patients randomized in between the two groups. And the primary outcome was successful extubation. So this is what you see, but essentially what I want to show you with this is they had the predefined strategy, what to do once they pass the SBT. And you can see that most of these patients were reconnected to the ventilator for a period of time. So they could have passed the SBT, reconnected for some time and then extubated later on. They may have had a prophylactic non-invasive ventilation, about 9% 
or high flow nasal cannulae. I think this is becoming now almost common practice to do it as a standard of care. Certainly most institutions, I see lots of people nodding, so I think it's probably common practice. Uh, but the NIV and the reconnection was um, left to the um, clinicians, but they had to decide pre-randomization. Now the usual cartoon, you can see there, pressure support eight and zero for 30 minutes versus TPs for 120 minutes. So you've got two strategies. One is the type of strategy, and one is the duration. Okay, so it's very difficult to know exactly which one uh, worked or didn't. But you can see here the successful extubation was quite high, it was 83% or 82.3% in the um, uh, um, intervention group and 74% in the TPs. So these are patients who are already ready to be extubated uh, from the very first moment. And you can see the intubation rate is 11%. Now you can say this is a very low, very high, depending on your uh, case mix. Um, I think it's a low compared to the literature, but we'll see, we'll see what um, other data presented. But you can see this is, I put a question mark there, because I'm not quite sure, even the authors were not quite sure what, whether this signal is important or not, but certainly worth discussing. The hospital mortality was 10% in the pressure support and 15% in the TPs, and you can see the hazard ratio over there. So this is the primary outcome, successful extubation. But this, I thought, was quite interesting. The extubation after the first SBT it was 92%, so almost everyone was very simple um, uh, uh, weaning. So in other words, almost every patient got extubated at the first SBT. So this might not be your population of patients. Um, certainly, I don't think it's the one I'm used to seeing, but that's what they had. You can see the uh, reintubation was the same. The in-hospital mortality, this is something worth discussing, uh, but you can see it was 10 versus 15, and 13, 90 days, versus 17. So it would appear the SBT increases that hazard ratio. Now, what you can see here that from the Kaplan-Meier, that once the patient gets extubated, then the, the um, successful extubation is the same past the very first few hours. So you get the impression that these patients were very simple, ready to be extubated straight away, and everything else is parallel. And this is the one you'll find in the supplement, and it's mortality, and you can see these two curves being slightly divergent uh, between the TPs having a higher mortality than fresh support. So this is the conclusions, and uh, that pressure support ventilation leads to higher rate of successful extubation and perhaps uh, without increasing the risk of reintubation and maybe this might be a preferred strategy which is in line with the American Thoracic Society guidelines published uh, last year. And this is the fifth one which is um, cheating a bit because I put it over there as a slide but the next speaker will talk to, uh, to us much more in detail about the EOLIA trial. And with that, I'll just give you a little summary. So when we set the PEEP, they're similar to the uh, PEEP FIO2. Deep sedation plus neuromuscular blockade is similar, but I put inverted comma because I'm not quite sure about this signal to harm of neuromuscular blockade versus the comparison. Routine recruitment maneuvers is inferior to non-routine and different level of PEEP. We've seen about the SBT with uh, press support or PEEP alone, and we'll see about the ECMO versus conventional mechanical ventilation. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs> Great as always, Luigi. So I think we have some time for questions. That would be great. I think uh, Luigi went over quite a bit of data there. Uh, so any questions? It's one. Um, with regard to the uh, uh, the issue of lung recruitment being having a worse outcome. How much do you think that is due to the fact that the lung recruitment maneuver is 
to my way of thinking anyway, a very aggressive uh, and prolonged one with very high pressures and for a long, long time. I can't believe right ventricle sooner or later gives up after some of that sort of uh, challenge. <clears throat> I think the short answer is that I fully agree with you. I mean, it's, uh, it's prolonged, it's really high, 60 peak with a peak of 45. And some of these patients had repeated recruitment maneuvers in the following days. Not many, but um, during the first analysis, they had to change protocol for the recruitment maneuvers because lots of patients were essentially developing shock. Um, so I fully agree with you. So the concept that such a high recruitment is injurious, it doesn't mean that a more gentle, shorter, um, tested towards lung rec recruitability first might not be a right thing to do. So I think perhaps, you know, given the hazard ratio, we can say that when you use one so prolonged, so intense, might not be a good thing for everyone. Yeah, it might be more selective. Other questions? The um, paper with the uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, yeah. and you talked about the ICU weakness. Yeah. Um, did they look at um, like a ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction with ultrasound of the diaphragm? No, I, I, very important question, uh, but they didn't. It was, um, at least it's not reported in the supplement or in the main paper. And in the protocol, I couldn't see that they've done such a thing. I think it's very difficult to do ultrasound for a very prolonged, for a large number of patients. Uh, but yeah, it would be interesting, yeah. I was just going to ask how comparable you think two hours on T-piece is versus 30 minutes on PSV, you know? That's my only criticism <laughs> of that. I agree. I think, I don't know, maybe as, say, as a clinician, I would have liked to have similar time and maybe different strategy uh, or the other way around. But I think there are two different things here. So having a patient for two hours on TPs, it depends when you start your SBT. So let's say you start your SBT at four o'clock and you finish at six o'clock in the evening. Some units will not extubate that patient for that day. So he goes back on the ventilator and you extubate on the second day, So which again, uh, it affects the, the primary outcome. Uh, and then I agree, you know, what's the difference between 30 minutes of one versus 30 minutes of the other? But I'm sure there will be more discussion later on. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Luigi, for a very nice uh, overview of this, uh, some of the most important papers published last year. Uh, if we can, may, I would like to make just two, three comments on Please. all these uh, issues. The first one is that what I think we can learn from this is that we have to be very careful to uh, accept findings from relatively smaller sized uh, studies. The, the study that you showed on paralyzing agents was coming from the French study, was national, was multi-center, but national study was not multi-center, was not multinational, uh, was underpowered, the fact that there was some improvement in the paralyzing agents in terms of outcome was a sort of post-hoc analysis in less than 120, that to say why less than 130, was not uh, previously planned. So when they did, they did exactly the same study in the United States with a quite large amount of patients, uh, uh, they found completely the opposite. So first message to me, we have to be extremely careful to uh, to have a final answer from underpowered study and not to complete the studies and so on. So, uh, and I'm very glad that the uh, Americans, they redid the study. We should redo many studies before to have. The second point is the interpretation of uh, the findings. Uh, for example, the ART trial. You, you brilliantly showed the, the study, the results, the, the, some positive and negative issues. Uh, anyway, I think that this study, which was, of course, greatly criticized, but uh, uh, this study was greatly criticized because it was on the opposite side of what we expected. Uh, 
then we will discuss, again, one can have one idea, the other idea, this is not matter of discussion now. But can you, I, I would think in a little bit different way. Imagine that this study was positive. If it was positive, so sur more survival in recruiter, higher peep, uh, recruitment maneuver, uh, everyone was applauding that. It would be say, wow, you see, recruitment, higher peep is very effective. So now, since it's in the opposite of what we think, we are criticizing the study, which is good. But we have always to think what would happen if the study was in a different direction. That I think is, mm -hmm. is also important. And the third comment uh, is that, uh, really, you, you pointed out very, very correctly. When we do, we have to look at the primary outcome. The studies are powered for the primary outcome. Uh, for some of the secondary outcome, if our play planet, then whatever other interpretation may arise, some discussion, but have to be always uh, very carefully interpreted. If we look at uh, a bigger randomized trial. These are about the three comments thank you. from the overall... Uh, Can I allow the quick... Yes, of course. So thank you very much. I agree completely with your first and third uh, point. And um, <clears throat> thinking about the second one, which was if the art trial was positive the other way around, would we have applauded it? I think probably we would have, but I suspect <clears throat> not many people would have done it. Because I, I think the protocol is so aggressive that um, many people would be really scared of using that same protocol. Um, and there are many things that perhaps we can say they don't really apply to our population. And the protocol is incredibly aggressive. Uh, volume control, really low tidal volume, lots of sedation, lots of vasopressors, cardiac... So I, in a way, even if the um, odds ratio was 0.8 rather than 1.2, um, the same way around, I still I would have found it difficult to apply the same protocol, personally. But I think other people as well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. This was, uh, this was what they uh, read and, uh, years ago they published. Yeah, the Matos. Uh, yeah. uh, in two studies, in Medical Care and American Journal. Yeah. Uh, that's what they, they were very, uh, they thought that this was the, 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 the right way to go. Can and to his Just if you have one second, regarding the transformer pressure study, I will discuss a bit, but uh, I think that even there, there was a psychological bias by Talmor. I discussed yeah. with him. <coughs> yeah. Because in the, in the first study, they could compare the low PIP NIH table with the esophageal pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I don't discuss here why then you have a lot of difference in mortality again when we have few patients. I think that I discussed with some editors, JAMA, New England, and Lancet should not publish any more studies with less than 1,000 patients randomized in ICU and uh, less than 2,000 patients in operating room, in my opinion. The other studies are pilot studies uh, because the variability is so high that you don't have get any. But the psychological bias is clear. They were so convinced that esophageal guided uh, uh, PIP uh, selection was so good that they compared with the high, high yes. pressure. And they did not find any difference in terms of PIP selected. So that would have been, uh, in my opinion, that study should be redone, adequately powered, probably, of course, it's not easy with these patients, <laughs> but compared with the low PIP, PFIO2, because in that way we should have, but they were so convinced that it was so positive that they compared probably with the wrong we, we, yeah. I don't know if you're wrong or not. There was no difference uh, in terms of primary outcome, then of course the secondary can be discussed in this time. But this is also means uh, how we are biased when we are uh, planning or replanning a larger randomized trial. I think this is very important mm -hmm. for all of us that are involved in this kind of PIP trial. And clearly there was no separation of PIP between the two groups. Yeah, so. because, uh, the two techniques uh, showed the same PIP selection. Mm. Uh, and, and probably also the individualization. There was some individualization in both groups, but w with the same average uh, level. I would be very curious to see these strategies compared to the low PIP. 
if you look at the American study, there were no difference, so you no. would expect even no difference. But the message would have been much stronger, because in that case, we don't know exactly what can be interpreted. Thank you. So I, I have one question for you, Luigi. <coughs> so I would say the theme continues. <coughs> lots of money, lots of trials. You can go back 10 years, 15 years, and the majority of trials are negative. Yes. Why is that? Why is that? I think um, it's becoming clear to me personally that, uh, like many other people, perhaps the strategy of um, taking patients and randomise them into groups, regardless of their biology, physiology, uh, diagnosis, underlying diagnosis, <clears throat> and apply two strategies and hope that something will become positive might not be the way to go forward. Maybe clever designs, um, randomized trial design, adaptive design, some biology, some phenotypic um, um, uh, Probably many things enhancements, against us. Yeah, yes. all that yeah. sort of thing. So personalized yeah. medicine. Yes, and is it, is it possible we don't know as much as we think we do about mechanisms? Yeah. I agree. I completely agree and not don't want to kill the joy but I would suggest just there's no magic bullet that's all it's like APC yes you know everyone pinned their hopes and then it turned out to be negative yes but there might be a, a magic bullet for a group of patients uh, but not the signal might be very dilute yes well you've been wonderful lots of interaction thank, thank you thank you very much Luigi <laughs> excellent